have hope in the future generation. But the future generations don't have much hope in us. And that's scary. Because really, things are moving so rapidly now in terms of health and environment, where the two are merging, that we who are adults have to be the change and the example. Welcome to The Whole View. I'm Stacey Toth of Real Everything, and I'm here each week to dive deeper into how we can find happiness and health inside and out through self-love, body positivity, and discovering new ways to be our best selves. Before we get started, a reminder that this show is for general educational purposes and is not intended to diagnose, advise, or treat any physical or mental illness, and we always recommend that you see a licensed health professional accordingly. I want to welcome David Steinman to the show. He is an environmentalist, journalist, consumer health advocate, publisher, and author of five books focusing largely on environmental, dietary, and consumer safety issues, including Diet for a Poison Planet in 1990, and most recently, Raising Healthy Kids. He is the founder of the publishing company Freedom Press, which publishes Healthy Living Magazine. Welcome to the show, David. It's great to be with you today, Stacey. Thank you. So, Listeners, I'm going to be fully transparent. And David, so you know, there are some things that I am like the biggest cheerleader and advocate for and some of the things that you write about. And there are some things that I think we might have, I might challenge you on. And I think that is a really healthy thing for listeners to hear so that they can be empowered to make their own decision about what works for them. My background for you, David, so you don't know, is 15 years ago, I started writing dietary cookbooks and have come a long way since then in terms of realizing the harm that some of the restriction and those things can cause now that I have four teenagers and I saw what raising those kids in that environment can do. And at the same time, recognizing that there are potentially harmful things in the foods that we eat, the things that we put on our skin, the environments that our, our children are growing in. So I live on this kind of weird cusp of both really wanting to be scientifically driven, but also not wanting to create too much stress in my children's life, which can also be really harmful and those kinds of things. So I'm wondering if you can share a little more about yourself and the journey that you've been on, because I think it will be relevant for the conversation that we'll have going forward about your latest book, but also a lot of your passions over the years. Oh, that sounds great. So you've got four teenagers. Well, you're one, you're, you're one up on me. <laughs> okay. I started working in the environmental and anti-toxic movement in the 1980s. And because I'm a little older than some folks and younger than others still, the eighties were a time of great darkness. For those of you who don't remember a time before the internet, there was no internet. We were isolated. And as a reporter working on chemical toxins, I had to find victims, but before the internet. Victims were isolated. I can give you some examples. I wrote some pieces about hair dyes. Back in the 80s, we were just learning that hair dyes, especially the darker ones, were a cause of cancer and non Hodgkin's lymphoma brain cancer, both in women who use them, but also in their offspring. Yet, finding those victims then was very difficult because what do you do? Walk into a salon and say, hey, can I talk to all the persons using the darker dyes? I would get calls from hair dye companies saying, if you print anything that our hair dyes are carcinogenic or cause cancer, we're going to sue the pants off of you. So the industry worked by intimidation and it worked by isolation. And also just to keep in mind, when we're talking about hidden chemical toxins and their effect on our lives, this is a really new movement. 
it really didn't begin until around 1962 when Rachel Carson published Silent Spring. And before then, most of the environmental movement was focused on dams, mountains, and rivers. You know, don't dam the rivers. Um, let's not turn mountains into coal mines. Um, and let's save our forests. It was based on things we could see, big things, which are hugely important. But Rachel Carson brought us a whole new way of looking at environmentalism in the world. Before her, we didn't have concepts like a part per million or endocrine disruption. So we're also a really young movement, a movement so young that we've even had to invent our own language and words to describe like neuroendocrine disruptor. Who the heck knew what that was before 2000? A lot so of I people start... don't know what it is today. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so it's, it's, we are a young movement. And so things changed with the internet. And now people share their stories about chemical toxins in their lives. And now when people are sharing their stories, we can see that the effects of chemical toxins are occurring in everyone's living room now, in everyone's home. So for me, it's been a journey. And I was, by the way, when I began this in the 80s, I was the victim of toxic poisoning myself. I had grown up fishing all of my life and even worked for commercial fishermen into my 20s in the Santa Monica Bay Area of California. Little did I know that a chemical company called Montrose was manufacturing DDT and that they dumped 2,000 tons of DDT tainted waste sludge into the Santa Monica Bay where I fished. I eventually did a study, it was the first one on the West Coast that showed that the persons eating the most locally caught fish had the highest levels of industrial chemicals and pesticides in their bloodstreams. And we measured the blood these in the blood of about 40 people. I participated in that study myself. I wanted to know. And that's when I discovered, oh no, I'm being poisoned by the calico bass and bonito and barracuda halibut, white sea bass that I'm eating. That changed my whole life. That's when I began to realize if I don't take steps now, I'm going to be a, just another toxic victim because the levels are just going to go up. The stuff doesn't break down very fast and it builds up in your fatty tissues. So today, it's a much different story. People are really interested in protecting themselves. Today, the, the key issue, though, I think, Stacy, is empowerment. And that is, we know so much now, we can become self-defeating and just say, well, everything seems to be poisoned, so what's the use of even trying? Let's just party on the way um, to oblivion. So it's... But you have to fight that. And so that's where I am today. I've written Raising Healthy Kids, Protecting Your Children from Hidden Chemical Toxins. That's my new book. And it's meant to help every parent to become empowered to protect themselves and their children and family. It's interesting to hear that journey that you've taken in your career and to be where I am, not as deep or as long into this, but the way that you said that some people feel very overwhelmed because there's problems everywhere. And so how do they even solve it instead? Let's just party on the way to oblivion, so to speak. Hopefully people don't actually feel that way, but rather like not wanting to sit in hopelessness is also a valid feeling. I think it's interesting because my 16 year old is very passionate about the political landscape and having representation of people who will be around long enough for the planet to not be destroyed. Those are his words. From his perspective, he feels very passionately that if you do not have people representing the entire population in the best interest of, let's say, not just him growing older, but his children and his grandchildren to have a planet that is safe and sustainable for people to live in, then we're not actually representing the people here in America. And it's 
interesting to me to see. I have four children and two of two of them are like not into these sort of things. And two of them are very passionate about these things. And to know that is the next generation gives me hope, right? That there is not just him, but I see it on TikTok and on social media everywhere of people really wanting to make a difference in terms of creating a healthier environment for everyone, not just themselves, but for those people who don't have access to some of the cleaner and safer brands that are more inaccessible simply because they're either harder to find or they're more expensive or those sort of things. And it's not realistic to think that everybody shouldn't have access to safe food. Everybody shouldn't have access to safe personal care and cleaning products and all of these things that we're now finding, as you say, our living room is can be a place where there can be toxic things. I recently, as educated as I am, and I've been doing this for years, found out that in my county, we have the same chemical that the movie Aaron Brockovich is about at six times the regulation limit. And I felt like sat down the entire family and I was like, I'm the only one using the reverse osmosis filter water system because you all don't want to sit there for an extra 20 seconds for how long it takes. It takes a little bit longer for the water to fill up than just at the sink itself. I'm like, let me tell you, you've seen the movie Aaron Brockovich. That's the water that you're drinking right now. But <laughs> we have hex yeah, we yeah, have hex- six. Yeah, hex and what, and is it in your public water supply? Stance? It is. It oh is. Oh my! And we live in a very affluent county, and it turns out that there's not a limit of like what is regulation recommended versus what would cause someone to come in. There, there is no problematic statement coming in by the county saying this needs to be fixed and blah blah blah. I I just don't understand why, if we have the means, why every single water, public water, is not using reverse osmosis. Like, what are they telling you? Oh, they're not telling us anything. It's just are they saying, "Oh, it's safe, no worries." It's yeah, yeah. There, it's just a few parts to (laughs) go. Yes, exactly. You have to go to different kinds of consumer watchdog websites to even find out what's in your water sources, and we use a brand of water filter called aqua true and they on their website have the public findings you can also find them at like wg and so i've gone through and looked at a couple of them to see what's in our water and i was shocked i really was so anyway all of that to say that what concerns me is that it's not accessible for all families to buy a reverse osmosis system in their home and children We all remember being children, right? We all remember feeling invincible and like, it's fine. And I don't have the patience. Mom's being ridiculous about this water filter system. Yet as a parent, you see your child. I vividly remember in the movie, Erin Brockovich, where she's explaining to the mom that there's something in the water that's harming their family. And the mom immediately like has this light bulb like, oh my gosh, what? And goes out and tells our children, get out of the pool. And I feel like we all have that moment as parents where we learn something new about an ingredient that's in something we're using, water, different kinds of things that are in our lives that we have that light bulb moment and we want to tell our children, get out of the pool. And meanwhile, our children are willful, independent, hopefully vibrant beings who have their own wants and needs in life and there's that difficult bridge right where we want to be protectors but we also want to empower them so i'm wondering if maybe we can talk about what you found in your book and those kinds of things and also where as parents we can find that happy medium for what works for us right it's different for every single family on what those are for you in terms of for me i'm less concerned about the dietary choices than i am about the impact to mental health of restriction yet at the same time i'm going to make some food choices that i know benefit the health and wellness of my family so that those choices are in the house for them to make themselves right versus like my teenagers well actually have 
two 18, I have an 18 year old and a 19 year old and then a 16 year old with a car and all three of them will just go get whatever it is that they want. But at the very least, it's a little bit like I'm creating a um, barrier to entry for them, right? <laughs> like what's in the house versus what's not in the house. So maybe a little different perspective than some of the younger parents of younger children who are first coming on to this journey. What have you found as you've been researching all of this and the stories that you're hearing, but also some of the science and studies that you've done as well? I think what you, what you described is totally relatable. That is, how do you impact your kids? They have their own needs. I remember when kids start become teens, one of the things mine did was they started using cologne and perfume. And I remember they brought home some stuff that they had bought at Target. I think it was English leather and canoe. I actually sent this stuff to the lab and we found it was loaded with a chemical called phthalate, which it is a plastic and it decreases testosterone in boys and messes around with the sex hormones in both males and females. It's a really bad stuff. And, but they want to use something. So, I mean, in that case, we went to, I shared with them some products that had essential oils that were bit essential oil based, which might be a little safer. What I do know is these, the fragrances that, you know, that I just described, English leather and canoe and so on, were just loaded. It's a process. And I think that with the, you also mentioned that your one of your kids wants equity and representation. They want themselves to be represented and then the future generations to be represented. And you also mentioned that you have hope in the future generation, but the future generations don't have much hope in us. And that's scary because really things are moving so rapidly now in terms of health and environment where the two are merging that we who are adults have to be the change and the example. You also mentioned the how expensive it can be so supposedly so expensive to be healthy, to buy the safe brands. So there's a lot of things going on in what you said, some myths that I, that I've tried to bust in my new book, raising healthy kids, just as an example, you mentioned drinking water and the chromium six. One of the big lessons that I took from writing, raising healthy kids is that you do have to filter your water. And that buying water in plastic bottles, to me, is evil and self-defeating. Now, I don't mean that you're literally evil if you're buying water. You're carrying a lot of in plastic bottles. It's heavy, and I hope you don't live on the second floor. I have a friend who lives on the fourth floor. Whenever that friend buys, I'm trying to get them to change <laughs> because it's a lot of plastic. I say, I don't want to keep lugging this stuff up. Let's get you a, an RO, a reverse osmosis filter. They're starting to realize now, hey, the thing is, I worked in Cancer Alley, Louisiana to write this book. Cancer Alley, Louisiana is between Baton Rouge in the north and New Orleans in the south along the Mississippi River. It's the most industrialized corridor in the Western Hemisphere with about 200 chemical plants. And I've made tremendous friendships there in working. I also know that the people are relatively uh, impoverished. Incomes may be fifteen, seventeen thousand dollars a year. Now I know all about living on a budget. In fact, I know about how to live without a budget, because I'm an activist and a writer. And those aren't exactly the most. It's not like running a hedge fund. Let me put it to you that way. Which one of my kids wants to do? I say go for it. <laughs> but I worked down there, and I worked with the folks there. And one of the things I learned is. Even if you can't afford that $350 in one shot or $500, it's about $350 now. Maybe $200, you can get a reverse osmosis system. But it's going to be $200 to $300. It's so worth it. But even if you can't afford it, what I've pointed out is go get yourself a little filter that fits right over the end of your faucet on your sink and install that. You can buy one right now online for $20 to $25. Go to Amazon or another site. Then get yourself a zero water pitcher filter, which filters out, it's shown to filter out all of the forever chemicals, those 
PFAS chemicals, as they're known, add stain and water resistance to so many products in everyday use. So for about $50, which is pretty much in anyone's budget, you can actually do a great job of filtering your water. It won't be quite the same as the RO system, which will get upward, I would say, of 90 to 95 or more percent of the contaminants. But the system of a filter at the end of your faucet and then the zero water or net breeder or pure pitcher filter will get you about 85 to 90 percent filtration. Some chemicals may be a little more difficult. But that's the first thing to do. In fact, one of my kids is off to college now, graduate school. And I just sent them a pitcher filter and faucet filter and shower filter for their new apartment. I have another friend whose daughter is going to school at Tulane in New Orleans. And they just did the same. They got their daughter a, a reverse osmosis system because you don't need to spend Another, you don't need to spend $500 to have your water tested in America today to know that it should be filtered. Because even though the legal contaminants, like those that are used to disinfect the water and keep it safe from bacteria, eventually form carcinogenic substances that end up in the finished product. And those can be very easily filtered out with a, the, the, that kind of filter system for $50 I told you about. And as you do get a shower filter too for another $20 because you inhale a lot of the volatile organic contaminants. When they get heated up, they become gaseous. So when you shower, you inhale them, and they also are absorbed through the skin. So really, for under $100, you can do a pretty good job of protecting yourself from your drinking water. I don't like bottled water, Stacy, because in the communities that I've visited, like in Cancer Alley, all that plastic for those bottled waters is being made down there. The polyethylenes, the glycols, all of these chemicals are manufactured down there. They shed into the, and then they eventually shed their own contaminants into your final drinking water in some cases. So I don't like plastic because to me, that's part of the problem. It's to me, it's just really insidious. I won't be part of it. I was with a friend of mine who's fighting, there's one neoprene plant in America and it's located next to a school in Cancer Alley. And that's where they manufacture all the neoprene for your koozies, for your soft drinks, your tote bags, your wetsuits. And I was in a, a restaurant with them after we had gone to the school and we've done some projects there to help the kids at the school too with air filters in every classroom through my nonprofit. But we were at this restaurant and I was really thirsty. So I ordered a, something in aluminum, an aluminum can because aluminum is recycled. And then I got served the, with it, a styrene cup. And I said, no, I'll just drink it out of the can. And then she asked, well, do you want the straw? And I said, no. Now, right a little bit north of where we were is the plant that makes that styrene. In fact, it's really close to another friend of mine. It's called Amsty, American styrene. And it emits benzene, plants there in that area emit benzene, toluene, and other chemicals into the air mm. where then my friends are breathing. So I just said no to it. Now, you might think, well, that's spitting into the ocean. You're just one person, David. But I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I think I'm one of many. We need more. Remember, I said the movement is very young. But we need more people saying no to the plastic, no to the styrene. You, you, we're not insignificant because, Stacy, when we're doing this, even though we feel isolated, I might not know you before today. You might not know the people I know, Robert Taylor and Reserve, Sharon C. Levine and St. James, my really good friends who are being decimated by these chemicals. But you have to have kind of the faith that we are working together and making change. And I can give you an example of concrete change that is happening. In writing Raising Healthy Kids, Protecting Your Children from Hidden Chemical Toxins, I have visited a town in California called Salinas many times. Salinas is called the Salad Bowl of America because that's where all our strawberries and lettuce are grown. It's in the Salinas Valley. And all the schools there are carved right out of the farm fields. 
And when I used to go to Salinas in the early and mid 2000s, all these farm fields were surrounded. All the schools were surrounded by farm fields with chemically sprayed crops. They were spraying neurotoxins like diazinon so on the crops, which were not only hurting the kids at the school, but hurting our kids too when we feed them these foods because these little bits of neurotoxin actually increase our kids' risk for cognitive difficulties if we eat too much of them during pregnancy or they're exposed as they're growing up and even older through the foods they eat. When I went back to Salinas just a few years ago, all those same schools were surrounded by organic strawberry and lettuce fields. And I called up one of the teachers and I said, Oscar, what's going on here? And he said, well, because of folks like you, David, the farmers are all switching to organic cultivation because there, so there's so much demand for it. And I was really overcome. To me, it seemed like a miracle because I had been buying all these organic strawberries and this organic lettuce. People were telling me I was wasting my money, that there was no difference between them and the conventionally sourced. But that's not true. I learned that even though I didn't know it at the time, I was changing kids' lives in Salinas, California. And I bet many other communities are having their lives changed in the same way because of the greater demand consumers have for organics. 20 years ago, there was not even an organic label certification. It's not like the federal government, Uncle Sam came down to the people and said, I am going to give you organics. It was the people clamoring and saying, we want clean food. We need it. The media covering it. Politicians finally realizing it, that people wanted a better and safer food supply. So we got the organic certification. And then we got the studies that back it up. So today, if you're eating organic, the published peer-reviewed studies say you will have fewer pesticides. They've measured that in your urine and bloodstream and fatty tissues. They've measured it, researchers, and published those, that data. You and your kids will also have less diabetes, a less obesity. If you're pregnant, you have fewer complications. And your husband or partner will have, male partner will have more sperm and healthier sperm. It's a win all around. So we have made changes and we have impacted in very vital ways. But because things are so screwed up, Stacy, there's still a lot to do. And we who are in the baby boom generation or the next generation uh, coming, we have to start being really responsible. So you can start, as you mentioned, by buying safer products. It's not just that they're safer for you. It's that they're, which they are, but they make a difference in other people's lives because you shift production of chemicals from unsafe ones like propylene oxide and propylene glycol to just safer forms where pressure industry to find safer ways to make our products. And they make them cheaper. So over time, for example, many of the organic staples that we buy every day for our kids, like lettuce, celery, cucumbers, apples, bread, are about the same price, sometimes tomatoes, sometimes even cheaper than conventionally sourced today because the demand is growing. So we, as parents and just adults who are have half a brain left and want to try to save the world, we have to know we can do it. We need to do it because Greta Thunberg is right when she says she's lost faith and others in, in my generation. I really do feel like we're parting into oblivion and I've seen oblivion. I mentioned Cancer Alley and we've been publishing a newspaper there called Rise to educate folks. One of the things happening, for example, on, on our southern coastline in Louisiana, I went down to Houma, uh, Louisiana, to an what used to be called the Isle de Jean Charles. Isle de Jean Charles. It used to be thirty-two thousand acres, Stacy, and today it's about three hundred acres. Why? Because the ocean has washed over the rest of it. It's an eerie thing to drive out there on this really long road, and all is ocean, well, estuary and birds, and no more civilization. It's left to about 300 acres. So we can't be parting into oblivion. 
we can't fall for all this stuff about drill, baby, drill, because, or there'll be more coastline with global warming. What are you talking about? This, we're going to lose coastline. So it's really important that we engender some faith in future generations by acting sensibly and making these decisions to think about tomorrow in our shopping choices. I think you bring up a, a lot of different points. And for me, one of the things that I'm trying to instill in my children and that hits home for me is the idea, not so much that the non-organic strawberry is not going to have immediate negative health impact, but that bioaccumulation of these chemicals could potentially be harmful. And we know it is harmful for those people who are working on the farms and for the water runoff that then goes into our drinking waters where it can accumulate and all of these things like you were talking about in the fish that you were fishing and right, like whether it's a manufacturer dumping or whether it's water runoff of farms, all of these different kinds of things ultimately are affecting everyone and everywhere. And I think a lot of us come from, especially as parents, from the perspective of uh, selfish choices. And that is not a bad word because I'm a big one to advocate that self-care is not selfish and being selfish isn't a bad thing, that you are your own person. You have to advocate for yourself in many different ways. But I think when it comes to the choices that we make in not just the foods that we eat, but also as a woman who gets my nails done, as a woman who gets my hair done, I want to be making choices that those ingredients that I'm choosing to support financially, I'm voting with my wallet, are things that are less harmful to the person who is doing those activities for me. That while I might have a minor increased risk of someone who gets my hair done with, let's say I was using a darker dye like you were talking about before, but also we know that the chemicals in hair products, especially for melanated women, are incredibly toxic. So let's say that was something I was using. If I chose instead to go to a salon that was intentionally using products that were less harmful, it means the people who are working at that salon are exposed to less harm. And the workers themselves on the farms and in the salons are the ones who need the most protection from us. So if for whatever reason you are feeling like, you know what, I'm not going to worry about making these choices for my foods, potentially if you have the ability as often as you can to make other choices, it's helping others. And I'm back to like that original point that I was making, which is that not everybody has the ability to afford organic. Not everybody has the access to organic vegetables. When I shop at my local Asian food market where they have a huge plethora of produce, produce it is a, it's a magical store. And when my kids were younger, it was like their favorite one to go to because the seafood department had all these creatures that they'd never yeah. seen that, that were alive and right it was this whole experience but there's very few organic choices at that store and so for someone who is either shopping there for cultural reasons or shopping there because price right like we know that is not something that's necessarily available but by other people who do have the ability to make those choices doing it as you say it has this trickle down effect of making it more accessible for all, making it more affordable for all and hopefully helping all. And the goal for me, as I mentioned in the top of the show, is like in this weird kind of limbo between I live in this place where I'm like, I don't want anyone who is choosing to eat conventional strawberries to feel shame, either because that's the choice they're making or that's because their budget doesn't allow for them to prioritize all organic. And at the same time, for those people who do have access to fully understand the positive impact that you can have, not just in your own life, but on the life of others by choosing sustainable and safer options. And it's not just strawberries. It's like 
everything. And I would say that there is, it feels like a little bit of a tidal wave or maybe it's a tsunami, right? Because I feel like we've made progress and then it's almost like uh, culturally, there's a little bit of a pullback right now in terms of really pushing back on some of the progressive, positive, sustainable things that are being happened. And then hopefully like we're going to move forward in a very large push when the generation, all of my children, two of my four children will be able to vote in the presidential and local elections this coming cycle. And I think that they're, I know that their priorities are on these sort of things in especially eco-conscious sustainability type choices. And maybe that can give Greta some hope, right? Like if she's lost hope in the baby boomer generation, not that it's everybody, there's a lot of people who care deeply. And I would argue why grandparents who were in the greatest generation, I think it was what it was called, were like the ultimate sustainability people. Like my grandmother used plastic bags, like reused plastic bags that she was given at least 47 times. And my grandfather, who had lived through the Depression and like literally dropped out of school in third grade in order to help his family be able to have enough income to feed everybody, like really suffered through the Depression. He would not let one bite of food be wasted. And if things got moldy, he would compost them for his garden where he grew his own. And so if I think about like where we are in the pendulum of time, I wonder what the heck happened that we got so far away from my grandparents, your generation's parents, maybe depending on when people were born, but where did we lose sight of some of these things that we were already doing? Was it for like, when did plastic bags at grocery stores become a thing? Because it used to be that you brought your own bags. And then we got really into the convenience of not having to think about it or worry about it being in our trunk. And then lo and behold, now we have plastic bags everywhere all over the world, hurting the sea animals and all different kinds of things. And so I'm like, I guess it doesn't really matter what went wrong because I can't fix it in the past. But I just oftentimes think about how my grandparents were the original kind of like eco hippies and they would not have associated with that. <laughs> that would not have been I am how they would have defined themselves. But that is how they lived. Yeah, you bring up such an important issue. How did things get so out of hand? And. I think this leads us to a discussion of laws, legislation. Things got out of hand, in my opinion, because technology has moved so much faster than legislation. Just to give you an example, today, chemicals called forever chemicals are showing up in the drinking water for about, I don't know, half of all Americans. And they're not safe. They cause kidney cancer. They're very dangerous. They're coming from products we use every day that are like stain resistant, flame resistant. They come from firefighting foam and they're contaminating water supplies. There are about, oh, there are thousands of these PFAS chemicals that industry has developed. As soon as one gets a notorious reputation, they develop a slightly different one. It's staying one step ahead of the devil. Well, EPA has set up the Environmental Protection Agency has set up monitoring or standards for about half a dozen of them out of the many thousands. But these are just monitoring standards. And they haven't banned a single one of these chemicals, not a single one, despite billions in dollar, of dollars in cleanup that communities are facing across the nation. We're talking about the Flint the lead crisis in Flint and the crisis with lead pipes. Well, we're creating another one right now. It's happening while we're watching. And every one of us should be so, every one of us should be, in my opinion, darn mad at, at, at our representatives, local, state, and federal for allowing this to happen. But there's something else too. We've been fed this myth, this lie as citizens that a little bit of these poisons won't hurt us. 
industry keeps telling us, well, 20,000 pounds of benzene dumped into your air in reserve Louisiana won't hurt you. Uh, two parts per billion of atrazine in your drinking water in St. James won't hurt you. A little chromium-6 in your water supply in the D.C. area is okay. This is such BS. This is gaslighting. There are no studies that show this stuff is safe at low levels. In fact, the, the studies that public officials are using, just to explain it, were based, are largely based on what are called rodent studies. That is, they feed mice and rats chemicals and see how many develop cancer. That's really old school. I know because I run the Healthy Living Foundation and we bring legal actions. We've sued Procter & Gamble for unsafe chemicals and won. So in court in California. So really, these chemicals are not safe. And a little bit is unsafe. We know this because today we are using different models to look at toxicology. For example... Today, researchers use a species of animal called zebrafish because they reproduce so readily, their embryo are transparent, so you can see right through them, and they, you can do many generations in a short period of time. And you can expose them to levels of chemicals measured in the parts per billion, like two parts per billion of lead or, or carbaryl. Now, you couldn't do that with rodents because you don't have the ability to look at the embryo in a rodent and see the same things that you would in a zebrafish. In fact, until zebrafish, we really couldn't study the embryo. For those of us, for those of you who are listening who don't know, before we become the fetus, when life starts, we are an embryo, and that goes on for a month or two where we're just a conglomeration of one cell, then two cells, then we divide into four, eight, and so on, but it takes months to get there. So for the first few months, we're just, we, you and me and all of us are just a few cells. Researchers are now able to look at what happens when you get exposed to just a few parts per million as an embryo. And whether you're a zebrafish embryo or a human embryo, at that stage, everything is very similar. You're a back, you have a backbone, you have a blueprint for your uh, nervous system. And all of that has to unfold with unflagging accuracy. And your cells are reproducing so fast at that point. There are many chances for error. We can see these things now. So we know that a few parts per billion exposure during the embryonic period of a child's life is going to have a profound influence. It may be so deadly that, that the embryo doesn't develop. And that's why we, so many women suffer from um, not being able to carry pregnancy to term. But they don't know that it's happening at the embryonic stage. But that's obviously a lot of times when it is happening. And now we know that. So we have to get rid of this myth that a little bit isn't going to hurt us. It does hurt us. It hurts our future generations. And we've fallen for that. As a result, government says, okay, industry, you can have up to five parts per million DDT in your seafood, or you can have 10 parts, five parts per trillion of PFAS chemical in your drinking water and it won't hurt. And the people go along with it. Really, Stacy, the only answer is zero tolerance. And that's something I want people to take to school, to home with them. And remember when their politicians are talking about legislation, Zero tolerance is the only way we can go now, because otherwise we've got what we've got today. So many different chemicals at so many different levels that we're being exposed in so many different ways. Researchers can't possibly know all the toxic effects. So I, that's really important. Zero tolerance. Yeah, I recently did a show. I think it was 117 with Dr. Jenny Yu, who works with Healthline and they're another health education online publication. And we went over the EPA's new regulation from this year about zero tolerance of PFAS in water. And I know I just want to make sure listeners aren't confused because you said earlier that there was no legal reference on that. And while that has been the case until very recently, it was huge and groundbreaking. Sorry, Matt. It was huge and groundbreaking that the EPA 
by way of the overall administration came out and said that in moving towards zero PFAS and creating this regulation and timeline around levels and a plan that essentially reverse osmosis in public waters is going to solve, that they would be saving thousands of lives, which in saying that is an admission that the current levels are causing harm. Even though the regulation up until that point had said, it's fine, it's not hurting you, right? So it's like this this difficult dance for me when I am looking at the science because rodent studies and zebrafish studies and all of these things aren't really telling us about bioaccumulation in human bodies. And we do know that if, for example, we look at some of the potentially harmful chemicals that have been linked in personal care in teenage bodies, and then we remove those, the use of those products for three days, that we see a drastic improvement just in three days of not using these products to health. And so for me, I, I want to help educate and empower everyone because the sooner we can learn about these things and make better choices for ourselves, the sooner we can reduce the bioaccumulation in our bodies. We do have a liver. Our liver can help us detox and can help us improve our health up to a certain point. And then at that point, we have put so many things in or chemicals that are so strong, like PFAS, that are called forever chemicals because we literally cannot be removed by our bodies. And they're in our water and they're in all these places that we no longer can filter and get rid of them the way that our biology works. And so we as human beings need to come up with ways to improve our environment, whether it's the water we're drinking, the food we're eating, the products we're putting on our body, and at the same time, constantly stressing about all of those things and thinking about, I had someone contact me who has a gas stove in their home and they were upset because they were like, I love cooking on my gas stove, but I recently learned that is problematic and I can't afford to do a complete kitchen renovation and switch my stove out. And my approach is instead of thinking of these things at that scale, right? Like you can get, for example, a, we have an air doctor. There's different kinds of air filters that you can get that might be more affordable or whatever it is, but it, it has literally like a red, yellow, green light on it. And it detects when we're using our gas stove. And it filters that air for us in addition to the vent that we're using. And we open our windows when the weather is nice outside. And I just know that I'm doing as much as I can within the confines of the life that I'm living without getting so stressed and worried and telling my kids, oh my gosh, you forgot to turn the oven off. And now there's methane everywhere in our house and blah, 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 negative. Like that doesn't serve us either, right? There has to be this balance of, for me, I'm very grateful that the EPA is now going to be hopefully holding businesses accountable and public water accountable to getting those PFAS down to zero. But we also know that's not going to happen for years to come. And so in the meantime, with the admission that is going to save lives from the government, what can we do in our own homes to reduce that exposure for our families? Oh, that's exactly what my new book is about. What can you do in any situation to make things better? And you mentioned the air filters. And that, that can make a huge difference. Studies have shown that uh, during pregnancy, moms who use air filters, actually their kids have two or three higher IQ points compared to kids whose moms didn't use them. And that's because they filter out as you mentioned, residues from uh, combustion and gas burning stoves or from local pollution, aromatic hydrocarbons, they're called, which all affect a kid's um, cognitive abilities. So we there are things we can do. Do we know if that's causation or correlation? Because immediately my thought is, well, yes, someone who has the affluent ability to have an air filter might be correlated with IQ versus causing that. I'd love to look at that study. I haven't seen it yet. Well, this study was actually done in Asia 
in a relatively not affluent population. So it's probably, I'll, I'll get it to you later and share it with you. It's actually in the book too. Um, but I, I think the point is, is that there are lots of things we can do. We don't have to fret over it. It's just good things to know. Um, just to give you an example, we're going back to school now. You want every mom and dad, every parent should be demanding of their school a drinking water report before their child goes back to school. That's because so many schools don't report that they have lead in the drinking water or they may have forever chemicals. And in chapter, my chapter called The New School Rules on Raising Healthy Kids, I share the story of a New Hampshire couple who sent their kids off to preschool. The preschool, they didn't know it, was getting their water from a contaminated well with PFAS chemicals. And their kids built up, as you were talking, bioaccumulation, horrid levels of the PFAS chemicals in their bloodstream. So now for the rest of their lives, they're going to be living like, do I have this ticking time bomb in my body? Now, this could have been averted by just demanding of the school, where's your water report? And if they don't have one, the kids shouldn't be drinking. First of all, if they don't have one, let's say you're in an elementary school, all the parents in that classroom can get together $10 each and buy a water test kit. And I show how to do it in the book and have the classroom water tested for lead and forever chemicals. You can do that, and then you will know. But in the absence of that kind of information, it's very it's actually dangerous to send your kid off to school and not know what's in the tap water. Because remember, they may be doing water sports. They may be showering in that water every day. They'll be eating food at the cafeteria made in that water. If the water has any lead in it, even one or two parts per billion, what you do is you do what you suggested, Stacy. You get a good water filter system, and you give your kid a, a, a stainless steel flask, and they bring their own water to school, and you avoid that problem. But if you don't, I write about the consequences. Your kid could really end up sick, building up these PFAS chemicals or lead. So this isn't something that you need to fret about, but you do need to become a black belt in protecting yourself in the uh, jungle of chemical toxins. And by becoming a black belt, I'm just saying you feel prepared, you know what to do. In this case, going off to school, please, mom and dad, get the water check. Don't just send your kid off to school and think everything is okay, because there's a good chance that that water will have something bad in it for your kids, and you don't need to have them go through that. I know my my kind of alarmist red flag bells went off a little when I heard you say it's dangerous to send your kids to school without knowing that. I also just want to like give grace to listeners that if that isn't something that you have done or would do, like that's okay too. You're still a good parent. Not that many of us are not doing that and I personally did go to our water, public water information. Like I said, I'll put actually some links in the show notes for you in addition to some of the other shows that I've referenced and any articles that have come up. But so that you can check if for most places it's going to be public tap water. And I would suggest that you check yours on multiple places, right? Like I mentioned the two places that I checked mine because my city county publications aren't giving the full picture the way that I was able to find on some other sources. And I know for me, if my children need to fill up their water at the water fountain in school, I don't want to discourage them from drinking water because that's an essential health thing. And at the same time, I'm going to make sure that what I can control at home is as safe as possible and encouraging them to use the filtered water. And there are some on-the-go tools if for whatever reason the public water for your children is of a concerning level for you. For example, my mom lived in a county where there were PFAS chemicals dumped from a manufacturing plant and it was the public government had advised people to not drink wow. tap water. And so if that's the case, wow. right, where you're having a public advisement like that, 
There are water bottles or different kinds of things that have filters. They were made, I think, originally for people who are hiking and outdoors and needed to have filtered water that wasn't going to poison or hurt them. And you can certainly have a water bottle like that that's going to have that filtration inside yeah. to send to your kids with school or whatever it might be if they don't have the same kind of filtered access that they would at home. But I do just want to put out there that for me, as someone who now has like older children, adult children, there's a lot of things that maybe I might be thinking, gosh, I would have, I wish I would have done that or I should have done that. And all of these things that don't change a circumstance, all that's doing is causing stress and shame in our brains and all of those things. And all we can do is the best with what we know at the time, right? Yeah. And so if now people are learning, there are these additional resources that we can do and we can make these choices and go forward. And to your point, David, like a lot of these things did not exist before the 60s. We saw a huge explosion with the invention of PFAS even, I think it was the 60s with DuPont and 3M and those kinds of things where we were creating Scotch Guard and we were creating Teflon, Teflon. and now we have PFAS everywhere. Things. Yes, exactly. Right. And so it, it isn't something that you would have known as you were growing up because it just wasn't known. It's now we're all learning and we're doing the best that we can. I agree. Yeah. And there's a lot to learn about and know about. Like we talked about multiple different things in terms of food and environment today. We haven't even talked about the harmful chemicals in your cleaning products that when mixed with water can create formaldehyde, even if formaldehyde isn't on the label, like all of these things that the more that I learn, the more I'm like, I am super educated. I spend my time researching and learning this. It's my job. And yet I still am learning and sometimes surprised by information that I find. So listeners, don't feel overwhelmed by all of this. I would ask David, maybe you could share with us what are the things that you would recommend listeners to do, something positive and actionable, some suggestion that they can take today, just like one simple thing. They're feeling overwhelmed, like, oh, coulda, shoulda, woulda, their whole lives, all the things. But if there's one thing that after they listen to the show today that they can walk away with and be like, okay, I'm going to do this one thing and that's going to be an improvement in my life, what would you recommend it be? Oh, that's, I'll go big here. I think I want people to just, be a little more conscious about their shopping choices, dig into them more and ask questions. If there are one practical thing I tell people about, it's probably the word organic. And the reason I say that, Stacy, is food is so primary to us. It's like we have mouths to eat, right? Not to talk, but to eat. And then to talk. So food is so primary to us. When you start thinking in terms of organic, and buying more organic foods. Now, I'll tell you, some organic foods are still more expensive, like organic, the plums right now, by the way, organic fruit in season right now, it's really cheap, folks. Go on to Instacart, plums, peaches. Yeah, in season, it's much easier. Oh, yeah. Accessible. It's great yeah. right now. Load up, load up. But when you're thinking, when you start thinking about organic, like you mentioned, it's a larger issue. It's a mind, it's a conceptual way of looking at things. Because once you start buying organic foods, then Stacy, like you said, you'll start saying, well, can I get organic cosmetics? Could I get or an organic um, feeding product? It's a way of opening up your mind. The, the concept of organics now is proven. It's not that it's perfect. We've, my nonprofit, the Healthy Living Foundation, has actually sued some companies producing organic foods for high amounts of lead. So. We are aware of the pitfalls, but overall, organics are so effective at reducing chemical exposures. It's a big deal, and it just changes the way you think about the world. So if there were one thing I would say, try to put more of your staples into the organic category. To, when you're shopping for your kids, get them the organic carrots, the organic celery, the organic lettuce. Particularly get them the organic bread. Loaf of bread we've ever tested has organophosphate pesticides, which are bad for kids' brains. They're nerve poisons. Organic breads won't have that. So organic breads, organic apples, just these or 
just these few changes will shift your whole way of thinking of things. And like you said, Stacy, the body responds immediately within a few days with the, as you mentioned, with cosmetic products. They might not have been organic, but I'll bet there were some certified organic ingredients in them. But I know the study you're talking about. And when you switch to safer foods, safer cosmetics, the body's cells respond immediately. The risk for cancer goes down, like you mentioned in that study. So I would say the one big thing is organics. Just start to make your shift there. And that's a big deal. I think for me, my one suggestion would also be to look inside your home at what you're already doing and seeing where you can lean on things you already have and removing things that might not be serving you the way that you want. So for example, do you have nonstick pans that have scratches on them and could be leaching harmful chemicals into the food that you're cooking? Can you throw those out and use that one cast iron pan that you have for everything? That's what our family does, right? Like we have a couple of pans and I'll never forget the weekend that I threw everything out. The kids were, a lot of them were away at work doing whatever. And it was like my project and they came home and they were like, where's the, this pan, where's the, this pan. And I threw out our ceramic nonstick pans is what they call them, which are really just, as you were saying, like another word, another way to do nonstick. But I had been tricked into thinking that these green pans that I bought were great. And then I did more research and I realized that there were still chemicals in them that weren't something that I wanted pouring into our foods when we were cooking them. So instead, now it's like enamel, cast iron, or stainless steel pans are the only choices that the kids have. And yes, it's less convenient to fry your egg, but you can still have a productive kitchen session that way. And I didn't actually have to buy anything new. I just threw out a couple of things that were no longer in good condition or that had chemicals that I had come to learn weren't great. And the same thing with like storage containers for food, right? You probably have some glass and some plastic that you've accumulated from takeout or that someone left at your house or whatever. Get rid of the stuff that you don't want people using because if it's not there, they won't use it. So. I think David's saying this is a way for you to be conscientious with your spending. And I would say even before you have to spend any money, you can actually look at what's already in your home and be like, you know what? I don't actually need 10 pans. I can use these four and we can get rid of these other ones that weren't ideal, but I've never actually thrown them out. So maybe a little fall cleaning for you. Oh, yeah. I, I like your idea, Stacey. So you get rid of a lot of junk too. And you say, oh, yes, God, yes. I haven't used this pan in 20 years. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I always feel inspired in the fall when the kids go back to school and the weather starts getting cooler, like the same way that people have spring cleaning. I have autumnal cleaning. I'm like, get rid of everything. <laughs> also, all those little plastic cups, the Spider-Man, yep, um, yep. Sleeping Beauty cups, the little plastic cups we uh, knowingly bought when our kids were babies. Yep. I didn't throw those out, but they're way up on the shelf in the little decoration center, the little nostalgia center for all the old little cups when my kids were three or four years old. So those I've saved, but I think your idea is great because we do consume way too much and we, and so much of it is useless. And I think t doing a, an inventory is a great way to start. Just look at what's in your home and what's in your fridge and your, all of your cleaning, your cabinet where you keep all your cleaning products. Do you have? garden sprays in there? Do you have like auto products in there or pesticides and stuff? And some of that stuff you might want to get rid of too. Yeah. I specialize in helping people switch over their personal care products. And that's the mentality that I have too, is like, look at everything that you already have. You can use the EWG app to scan the label. I think you can even do that on cleaning supplies and different things now. And then the worst offenders, throw them out. And start replacing one at a time. Like you don't, it doesn't need to be all or nothing because then you're not setting yourself up for success. Just slowly over time, start to make these choices. And hopefully you will also inspire and empower your children to want to learn about these things and to want to be a part of that change. Because what I found as my children have gotten older is that 
they do really appreciate the choices that we're making for eco-consciousness. And I'll give you an example before we wrap up, which is that if we're in the grocery store and we have forgotten our reusable bags, if I say to the kids, hey, can you go to the store or can you go to the car, grab from the trunk the bags I forgot them? Not once has my child ever said, and multiple children have said this too, not once has any of them ever been like, I don't want to, right? But if we're home and I ask them to run to the pantry to get more paper towels or something, I will get, and by the way, my paper towels are bamboo. They're not eco bad, but we use a particular brand that is eco smart. But I, I will say that in those kinds of choices that we're making, whether it's the paper towels that you choose to buy or the making sure that you're using reusable bags when you're going to the grocery store, all of these things, your children, they're watching you. They're seeing the choices that you're making and they're learning that you care about them and their bodies. They're caring that you learn about the planet. And if you also talk about the impact that this has to the workers at the farm, at the salons, at the different places that you're impacting, they're learning about helping other people. And I think that is a positive parenting approach that can be empowering and replicated instead of coming from like an alarmist, stressful kind of place that can feel really scary for children. So I hope that this has given listeners some inspiration and ideas. Don't feel overwhelmed, like we said, whether it's switching your paper towels or using reusable bags in your car or cleaning out your pantry or choosing organic when you can. All of these different choices that you're making one at a time will help benefit your family, whatever that looks like. So, David, I want to thank you so much for being on the show. Can you remind people where to find you, what the name of your book is, and all of those things? Sure. Thank you. Uh, my new book is called Raising Healthy Kids, Protecting Our Children from Hidden Chemical Toxins. And it will make you a black belt in the chemical in the world, in the jungle of chemical toxins. It's available at Amazon.com uh, or from your uh, local independent bookseller. And um, you can also visit me at DavidWilliamSteinman.com. That's my website. And this has been great, Stacey. It's been so fascinating talking to you. I've learned a lot. And I hope everyone listening to us has learned something too and feels a little more empowered. Like you said, we're all learning. Don't beat yourself up over yesterday. The body responds very fast, as you said, to, to good inputs. So just start now with a smile and we'll win this. We're all in it together. And, and that's important. I feel much more connected. Thanks to your show. Thank you. Well, thank you. A rising tide lifts all ships, I like to say. So thank you for, for being here and for fighting this fight as long as you have. Before it was cool, you have been talking about and educating about this and, and helping people. So David, thank you so much for being here. Listeners, if you've enjoyed the show, if I could ask you to go leave a review or subscribe to the show, it doesn't take you any time at all, but makes a huge difference in um, our ability to continue doing this work. And as always, we appreciate your willingness to be open to growth through your own personal change. No one is perfect, but in listening, learning, and unlearning, we can all choose to become better versions of ourselves for ourselves. Thank you so much for listening. And David, thank you so much for joining the show. Thank you, Steve. Bye-bye.